Well, good morning, everyone. We'll uh, call our meeting to order. Uh, first item we have is uh, request for bill introductions. Uh, Senator Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a bill introduction. It's RS-210508 on securitization for utilities. Okay. Um, I guess we need a motion to uh, accept that. I'll so move. We have a motion, a second. Second by uh, Senator Kirshen. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, that bill is accepted. Any other uh, bill introductions? Seeing none, we will start off with our hearing on Senate Bill 1, which authorizing the State Fair Board to use money in the State Fair Capital Improvement Fund for general operations for fiscal years 21 and 22. We'll have an overview by Victoria Potts on web, the WebEx. Welcome, Victoria. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, so I'll be briefing Senate Bill 1. Um, the bill is short, so I'll keep it short. Uh, Senate Bill 1 would allow the State Fair Board to spend money from its State Fair Capital Improvements Fund in the same manner as money that it expends from its State Fair Fee Fund for fiscal years 21 and 2022. Uh, the State Fair Capital Improvements Fund currently can only be used for payments of capital improvements and maintenance for the State Fair grounds and the payment of capital improvement obligations that have to have been financed. Uh, I would just also note that currently the State Fair Capital Improvements Fund is funded through two methods. First is an annual transfer of $300,000 from the State Fair Fee Fund. And then the second is the receipt of sales tax um, of sales made on the state fair grounds. And I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Victoria. Anyone have any questions for Victoria? Seeing none, thank you. Um, Senator McGinn, this is a bill that you introduced. Do you, do you like to speak on it before we have our uh, conferees? Oh, just something brief. As we all know, the COVID certainly has caused the state fair a lot of uh, challenges. And this uh, was brought to me by the new state fair director, Senator Berger, uh, to be introduced. And so I think um, he would probably be the best to explain it. But thank you. Thank you, Senator McGinn. So we'll move on to uh, proponents, and we have uh, Senator Ed Berger, our Interim General Manager for the Kansas State Fair on uh, WebEx. So welcome, Senator. You're, you're muted, Senator, if you'd take your mute off. See him now before he's not there. Is that it? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Chairman Billinger and members of the committee uh, to speak in support of Senate Bill 1. Uh, as has been outlined, uh, this has been a very difficult year for the Kansas State Fair. <clears throat> and when we have the fair, we have usually about 340,000 visitors uh, generate a considerable amount of fees from that. Uh, during the year, we'll have about 500 events on the fairgrounds. When we lost the fair in 2020, uh, we essentially lost 90% of our revenue. Again, we have typically 500 events during the year that generate revenue as well. We're down to about 125 events. So between the two, we've lost about 95% of our revenue, uh, a really significant hit. Uh, 
Uh, the fair board uh, really wants to hold the capital improvement fund as harmless as we can, but we also know that we have to do some things to keep our operation going uh, to prepare for the 21 fair. Uh, when we uh, again look at our, our fiscal situation, currently we have about $125,000 in our fee fund, and in our capital improvement fund, we'll have about $550,000. Our, our monthly expenses are about $225,000. Uh, we did get uh, some uh, COVID money, and we'll be using that as well. Uh, so those are some of the issues. Certainly, all it is is enabling legislation. Uh, we don't want to uh, use that uh, that uh, capital improvement fund if, if at all possible. We want to keep that in place because we have significant capital needs uh, on the state fairgrounds. Uh, we have been very proactive as far as adjusting to this this crisis. Uh, we have uh, furloughed four employees, and we have uh, about 25% of our workforce has been reduced. So we've been very aggressive. We also have uh, limited any expenditures, so only things of our emergency nature. Uh, so that is uh, that's the picture, and that's the issue, and that's the need. Again, it's an enabling fund. Uh, it won't be used until and unless uh, it is uh, is absolutely necessary. With that, uh, I'd stand for any questions that the committee might have. Senator, uh, you were breaking up early on. I don't know if you want to readdress those uh, initial figures where you was talking about uh, visitors and revenue and so forth. Sure. Uh, we end up having about 340,000 visitors to the State Fair <laughs> annually. We also have about 500 events on the fairgrounds. And, of course, uh, with the fair not happening, that's about 90% of our revenue. The special events uh, have gone from about 500 to 125. So that's been reduced significantly. Between the two, it's about a 95% reduction in our, in our revenue. So that's truly significant. Uh, we've been proactive as far as taking uh, action as far as uh, employees, putting people on furlough, uh, letting people go. Uh, but we really have to have a proactive stance as far as getting ready for the fair. Last year, we started the fiscal year, July 1, with $888,000 in the fair fund account. And we absolutely need to have that kind of uh, money available uh, to, to get the fair going. So that's basically the issue that we're dealing with. It's an enabling uh, piece of legislation. Uh, the state fair board does not want to use that capital improvement fund unless absolutely necessary. Senator McGinn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Ed, it's not just you. We're, everybody's kind of coming in and out, so we've got a little bug problem here. But uh, if you can hear me well. I can I hear did, you. I would like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I don't know this. I didn't follow up, but Legislative Budget Committee in December recommended the other million dollars for the state fair, and I don't know if LCC has met and approved that or not. Could you let us know if they did or not? No, the budget committee, we asked for 2.3 million and uh, the budget committee approved the second, they approved 1 million and they didn't approve, they did approve the 1.3 million. It went to LCC and LCC felt like there was, inf there was money coming down from the feds. Uh, that of course did not happen. Uh, the LCC has not met on, on the balance, the 1.3 uh, million dollar balance that we requested. And that was approved by the budget committee. Correct. I, I know the budget committee approved both. In the last meeting that we had in December, we approved that. I believe it was one or one point three million. Yeah, it was and one. I just, so LCC, have they or have they not had the discussion yet on what legislative budget committee recommended? I don't believe they had. They met, and they they more or less tabled it. They met in December, tabled it. I assumed they were going to come back uh, before session, but they did not. Uh, and any other questions? Senator Hawk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Berger, you mentioned that the feds had talked about, and I think we had even heard uh, that there might be a possibility there would be some money from the feds, and we had a national consultant talk about that. Do, do you know if the status of that 
uh, is still possible in terms of providing funds for state fairs around the country? It, to, Senator Hawk, uh, I do not believe in this most recent piece of legislation there's any proviso for fairs and exhibitions. So then ha there had been a request for money, I think $500 million for nationally for fairs and exposition, and that did not make it to the table. Uh, there is money in, in this most recent legislation for SBA loans, uh, but those are things that we really don't qualify for. Um, thank you for that piece of information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Petty. Uh, this is a follow-up to uh, Senator McGinn's question. Um, so, and and since Senator McGinn is on the Finance Council, I'm just wondering if this, that 1.3, so is it still, since it's on the table, so is it still dependent on the LCC, or is there a, I'm sorry, is there another route? Of, oh, it's too close. Well, Senator McGinn. So I'm not on City Finance and Council now, but the way we drafted the um, uh, budget allocation, it was that 50 million that wasn't tied specifically to COVID, but in that was Legislative Budget Committee got to recommend because we generally hear more budget items than LCC but it had to be approved by LCC. So LCC has to approve it for that money to move forward. I believe it goes to State Finance Council after they approve it. Senator Petty? Wrong. That's your question? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Berger, I got w one question for you. How many folks did you say you furloughed? About 25. We have about 26 employees and we're down to Oh, uh, 18 or 19 now. Uh, we also uh, furloughed. We, we furloughed four. But as far as open positions, we've got that many open positions at the state fair right now. And we, we really, we hire a lot of part-time people, and we've got to start gearing up for that as we get closer to the four. We've got to find sponsorships. Uh, we have to do all those kinds of things in preparation. You know, we just don't throw a switch in September for the state fair. It's a huge undertaking. That was going to be my second question is how, how soon do you need to get these employees back so you're fully staffed in time, time for the fair? Holding everybody off until March. Hopefully by then we might have had some additional revenue coming in from someplace. But I've told our people we can't do anything with employment issues until March. Okay. So hopefully the, that'll be a time frame that'll work for... Uh, Finance Council and the LCC. Senator McGinn. Uh, just a comment. Um, unless there's stimulus money, it appears to me that they really need that one or 1.3 million from LCC just to stay functional. I see this bill as more of an emergency fund in the event um, they get into a situation since it does end uh, June of 2022 is just to get them through this year in that emergency situation. So I, I just share that if this passes, this isn't going to solve their problem. They need the million dollars. Thank you. That, that, it's more of a fire extinguisher issue than anything else. Uh, you know, we, again, we desperately need the capital improvement funds, and that's why they were buoyed up with the sales tax revenue. Uh, we've got significant capital improvement needs. In fact, we were going to do uh, some improvement to the Expo building, which is the building most frequently used on, on our campus. Uh, but we deferred that this year uh, for obvious fiscal reasons. Uh, we need to be able to get that building in shape. It's, again, the most, most heavily used building on our campus. In fact, in December, we had the Kansas Beef Expo. And we had more than a thousand head of cattle in for that event, probably 2,000 people. It was a huge event, mainly because of that event had been canceled in Iowa and Nebraska and other places. So we really were able to capitalize on that. I, I see the 21 fair probably being the biggest fair we've ever had. There's so much pent up demand and so much excitement about it. So 
certainly we need to keep the, the operation together until we get to that point. Senator Hawk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question, and, and uh, Dr. Berger, you, you said uh, we, we clearly have a lot of capital improvement needs, and uh, my question is, if, if indeed, hopefully, LCC gets that 1.3 million, would you replenish the capital improvement fund if you had to use that, and are you able to do that with the extra revenue that the Legislative Budget Committee wanted to see you get? Uh, thank you, Senator Hawk. Yes, yes, we could. It's my understanding we can. There's a transfer annually that goes to the uh, capital improvement fund from the state fee fund. I think it's uh, about 5% of our revenue. So that certainly could be used to help replenish uh, money in that capital improvement fund. Thank you. And, and I guess the editorial comment I would make is I, I sure hope that uh, agreeing with Senator McGinn that the LCC and if State Finance Council gets that money improved so that we can uh, be functional for the next state fair. And, but I, I don't want us to think if we allow them to use their capital improvement fund uh, that we deplete that and and don't replenish that when we have funds available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Seeing none, well, uh, Senator Berger, thank you and uh, appreciate your joining us today. I apologize, we've had a little technical difficulty. Well, it, 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 I'm sorry if it's working. It's working well from, from uh, at least hearing all of you and I appreciate you accommodating me. I probably could have made it up there. The roads weren't as bad as I thought they were going to be. Uh, but again, I, 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 the support for the Kansas State Fair is just absolutely essential. It's a wonderful celebration of agriculture, education, and all things Kansas. Uh, certainly, it's something that we want to keep at the highest level. It's one of the finest state fairs in the country, and we want to keep it that way. Thank you a lot. I think we're all in agreement. We'll close the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 1 and uh, move on to a presentation on the Office of Recovery. And we will have Secretary D'Angelo. Secretary right. uh, Burns, uh, you are on uh, mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Apologies for that. Can you see my screen as well? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Good morning. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, to provide an update on um, the Office of Recovery's uh, activities. Um, one of the things that I will do this morning, you all have a deck. I'm going to try to move through it uh, quickly to make sure that there's a uh, time for questions. I'm um, understanding that some of you have been intimately engaged with this process from the beginning, as there are members of this committee that were actually a part of the Spark Committee. Um, but others, uh, some of this may Senator be Burns, new. Uh, the room actually just disconnected. It'll be just a moment. Okay. Thank you.
Secretary Wallace, are you back? I am. Are you all? Can you all hear me and see the screen again? Y yes, we can. I think we're back online. <laughs> all right. Thank you uh, for your patience with the technology. Um, as I was saying, um, I'm going to try to walk through this quickly to leave uh, time for questions. Um, as many of you know, uh, Secretary Julie Lorenz served as the executive director for the recovery office for the last five months. As we start to transition away from direct fund allocation and administration and are dealing much more with just targeted support and close out administrative procedures, um, the office's activities have moved under my purview and that's why I'm with you here today. So um, just to hop in here, uh, we are talking about um, the COVID-19 funds that came into Kansas. And today in, in the purview of recovery office really has been around um, the 1.25 that came in. And, but there are other dollars that did come in over this period of time, PPP, other things that have been direct towards hospitals, emergency response services, um, and other federal funds that went to federal pre-existing programs. But our focus and the focus of the recovery's purview has always been on the 1.25. And particularly within that, it's actually, just to narrow it, it's the 1.03 um, specifically uh, due to uh, the federal calculations, both Johnson and Cedric counties received direct allocations from the feds. And those dollars are, were not under our purview. Um, they went directly to those counties and we did not oversee those. So our focus and responsibility has been on that 1.03. And today I'm gonna walk you through how that money was allocated and give you an update on where it is as well as give you um, just a little bit of a preview of what we're learning about the newest relief bill as I wrap this up. With that, one of the things that just trying to set context, understanding that you know this was a very dynamic process from the point in which we started to engage this conversation, this just shows you um, kind of what happened across this period of time. Um, the SPARC committee um, met um, over you know th almost 30 times, Throughout this, you can see different points of where our cases in terms of COVID cases in Kansas um, began to escalate. The small uh, triangles um, in there, the red triangles, show you what we received new federal guidance. Um, and at each dot on this is when there was a SPARC committee meeting graphed. Um, this just shows how dynamic this process was and that things were ever changing, both from the federal standpoint, but also as to what was going in our, on in our state. And you'll see that a few times throughout this conversation. So when we look at the distribution of the $1.03 billion, um, it was uh, actually distributed in phases, and we will walk through each of those phases. Um, with round one going to counties and then the other round uh, being uh, allocated on priorities that were identified um, through the SPARC committee. And again, more than 25 meetings across that period of time, we thank them for their uh, service in that. With that, you will see, and this is just a snapshot, and again, I'll drill down into each round, that again, that there were priorities that were identified per round, first starting with the counties and then moving through, including things like education, connectivity, economic development, and so on for every round of distribution. It's important to note that our process was one in which um, those priorities were set by um, the SPARC committee. Um, and that steering committee um, really uh, played a pivotal role in providing the input and recommendations. Um, there was um, a larger steering committee and an executive committee that then made recommendations to the State Finance Council. What I will say is that it is important that to, to know that we had more than 5,000 subrecipients um, across this process, all across counties and the states um, that uh, were allocated dollars. This process really did serve to bring the voice of businesses, community leaders, and state entities to the fold to make sure we were um, matching on the priorities. One of the things just by comparison you'll see in your packet is that we were, if you even look at our neighbors, our process was different. Though that voice of business and community leaders, we were one of the few states, not only in this region, but around the country that had such a, a strong emphasis um, in ensuring that our community le leaders and business leaders were a part of our priority setting for the dollars. 
Um, in your packet, you do have the list of those that were on the executive committee, as well as the full steering committee. And as I mentioned, um, a few of the members of this committee did serve on the st steering committee throughout. So let's talk specifically about round one. Uh, there were 400 million that was distributed to the counties. And again, we're starting from that 1.03. The way that this distribution worked was that, um, again, if you were, I started and said both Sedwich and Johnson received their a direct allocation. That direct allocation from the federal government was based on a calculation of 194 per person in each county. Um, and so when the committee started, what we did was we took that same allocation and pulled that across all counties. And so that totaled up to approximately 350 million. But remember where we were last June and July, and we were still you know, learning different things. Our unemployment rate um, had started to skyrocket. Um, cases were starting to rise. And so there was an additional 50 million identified as an impact fund. And this was determined and distributed based on COVID rates at that point in time and a combination of unemployment rates. And so the amounts to counties varied. But remember, their first allocation was $94 per person per each county, and then there was an additional distribution. So all counties except for Johnson and Cedric were uh, eligible for the 350, uh, but with the 50 million, all counties were eligible and there was a distribution. Johnson and Cedric were actually able to take advantage of the impact funds as well. Just want to highlight, this is a, um, a study, it's a Harvard Global Health Institute study and not really looking so much at their data or their approach as to give you a snapshot of where we were in that June and July period. And you can see, um, unlike a lot of other states in Kansas, we had a lot of variants that different coloration shows uh, different levels of um, risk in relationship to um, uh, school openings, infection rates, testing capabilities, um, that was their, the, um, the metrics that they were using to populate this. This just gives you a snapshot of just how much variance was going on in Kansas. So this ability for counties to actually utilize their dollars to meet their needs and priorities was essential as you know we think about this. In hindsight, there could have been a lot of different things done, but this really did map on to where we were at the time. Just to give you a brief snapshot, based on the disparity reporting, these are the percentage breakdowns um, of um, how the counties have spent. Um, at the back of your materials, there are a set of slides that actually um, show you the transparency website where you can go in and drill down by individual counties, similar to this, where you can see where the different distributions are in any particular county, in a particular area, you can grab multiple counties. Um, we have tried to put this information out there where it is accessible. And if there are questions around that county distributions, um, we can talk a little bit more, we can do some follow-up in that space. But just wanted to give you kind of a general sense of what that has looked like. One great example, and we have many of these, but this is the one that uh, we have shared is that there has been great regional partnership. Um, these counties uh, work together, Chase, uh, Lyon, and Morris, to upgrade their radio system and improve their emergency response. This is just one of many of the um, great collaboration and partnerships that have come out of this that we know will serve Kansans uh, much further these dollars in just this pandemic. As we shift to round two, round two was set on a set of priorities by the SPARC committee, and they fell into four investment buckets, public health, economic development, connectivity, and education. Um, there is a breadth of programs here, as you can see. Um, these were administered by state agencies, moving money out to respective communities and entities uh, uh, respectively. Um, one of the things that um, I will say is that, again, this was dynamic. So what you'll see is that um, many of these were based on initial needs. And actually, over time, some of them, as you can see, with like the pluses by a few of these, even received additional funds once, um, as we learned more, realized that there was more demand in some of these areas. The check marks that show that the programs are complete, that means that their selection, funding, distribution, 
is all complete, there are still some that are still pushing out or and or um, have additional funds that they are still distributing, but everything has been allocated. And so as we move into um, round three, um, what we have here is um, the, uh, as we moved into round three, after looking at round two's level of investment, what Spark did was took a step, step back to see where the additional needs were. And what they found was that there were still three major buckets where there were needs, and those fell into public health, essential needs and services, and business resiliency and workforce support. In those three areas, as you see outlined here, at that top level, there were um, kind of a set of key investments in each area that um, Spark made a recommendation on. And then there are additional levels underneath that show additional um, things that were funded. Um, and so you can see, let's just take public health as an example. Um, for this column, what they identified as the main priority was testing at the time, and they invested in recommended 53 million. There were also other things in relationship to public health, additional dollars with KDEM and FEMA, PPE, so forth and so on. But what also happened in this round was there was a reserve fund that was identified. And these reserve dollars throughout this dynamic and fluid process were then moved into priority areas as they were identified along the way. You can see the dates as State Finance Council um, approved and started to move those monies around. So again, same with the public health lane, just as an example, you can see um, by the end of October, realizing that additional investment needed to be into testing, the dollars that were in the public health reserve were moved to the testing to increase that overall investment um, closer to 83 million instead of the original 53 million. Um, and so this just gives you an idea of just how dynamic this was um, the 20 million in business resiliency was moved to small business grants. The original um, small business grant uh, applications well out, out exceeded the original dollar amount that was identified. And so this was an opportunity to invest more in those spaces. A couple of uh, key observations. Um, and so, um, these are just a few things that um, you know kind of pop out at us. One that um, to we needed to be flexible and responsible. And so one of the things that happened, you know, again as I just mentioned with round three, was that there was um, kind of a recoup and a redistribution of funding to match on where we needed. Um, small businesses needed more dollars, and so they were shifted. Um, this happened throughout the process. One of the other things that was key and critical is that there was strong oversight, as we talked about, between the SPARC committee identifying priorities and making recommendations um, to the State Finance Council's overview, and then the work that happened between counties, task forces, uh, state agencies, and the recovery office. So where is the current uh, status of all rounds? So um, what we have, and remember, we're starting with the 1.03 um, as our total dollar amount. And what we have um, reported to date, and this is as of our December 30 reporting, um, is that 907 million um, have been obligated, okay? And 816 have actually, have, oh, total expenditures, my apologies. Um, so that leaves a balance of 126 mil million um, that has not been obligated. And, I want to be careful here and clear here. Everything has been allocated and is with an entity. Um, if you all remember, uh, the original uh, CRF package had a spend deadline of December 30, 2020, and uh, that was extended um, with uh, the new relief bill um, in Attorney, late. Yes. You broke up there about the last uh, minute and a half. If you could go back. I, we didn't hear anything you said there for about a minute and a half. Got it. So um, this is, um, you all are seeing the balance on where we are for the current funds. And with that, remember, we're starting from the 1.03 billion, 907 has been obligated. There is a balance of 126 that hasn't been obligated, but it has all been allocated. 
So the various entities do have the dollars. So those rounds that I just walked through, um, all of the dollars are out to the programs, to the counties. But there's just a reality that with the original deadline of December 30, 2020, when it was extended, it gave both counties as well as state agencies the opportunity to continue to spend those dollars down. So they have been fully allocated. I just want to double check that you all can still hear and see me. Yes. Thank okay, you. perfect. Something went away on my screen, so I, I wanted to make sure. So again, all one, uh, 1.03 billion is fully allocated and out the doors. There are plans by all entities to be able to spend those funds down. We're targeting on a actual March 1 deadline for the new spend deadline within the state, encouraging um, entities to close out these dollars and to spend them accordingly. Um, but that 126 is not sitting there, you know, needing to be redistributed or um, needing to be spent. It has been just fully allocated. But as you know, in a budget process, it takes uh, sometimes there's delays in getting things obligated. And now with that extension of time, there were real needs that agencies and counties could not meet by December 30. And with the extended time are able to actually meet real needs um, with those dollars and have plans to do so. This is just a quick uh, timeline. Um, it just gives you a sense that this work is continuing. Um, we have encouraged and are working towards a March 1 deadline, as I mentioned, for um, all entities to spend these current dollars. As you know, there's a new relief bill, more dollars coming in. We want to make sure we're wrapping these up and using these accordingly. And these are just some of our target deadlines over the next year as we continue to track on and wrap up these dollars. We just try to make sure we're showing a, a full picture that there's still work that we will continue to do around these dollars um, for the next few months around auditing, accounting, and compliance. Real briefly, I will touch on the new relief package. I'm just giving you a quick overview. Um, as I just talked about, um, you know, this is the process for the 2020 dollars that we just walked through. They came in, they came through um, Spark and the State Finance Co Council and were distributed across the various rounds and priorities. The reality of the new relief bill and the way that it is structured is that it is coming in with a set of priorities um, that have been pre-identified. And so these have been identified into direct buckets. Many of them are coming into agencies with um, a formulaic distribution um, of how they are supposed to move to and through. They are very prescriptive as they are coming into the state. We are still learning um, about many of them. Um, we have a, a draft chart that we can share with you later this week. It was a 5,000 page bill. Um, there are many different pieces of this and the guidance is coming out literally daily and particularly with the change administration. Um, we're continuing to get guidance to understand how many dollars are coming into to the state of Kansas per each bucket, um, what the mechanism will be. For some of them, it will be automatic and come into, um, say, an existing federal account. For others, the state has to put technically in an application or raise our hand to say, yes, we want those dollars. So we have been trying to get a clear picture on that and can share with this group uh, a little bit later this week, um, kind of our first draft of some of what where we believe those dollars will be coming in. But this will be a moving target for an extended period of time because it is not um, as clean as there's just one bucket of money. This is coming in in pieces and it is um, identified into clear priorities and agencies that most of it will flow through. There are also direct dollars that are going out to consumers, to businesses. PPP is coming, is um, they're continuing PPP and those loans, which will launch in another week or so. So there's also a whole nother set of dollars in this bill that go direct to various entities in the state of Kansas, um, similar to the first, but there are some that are expanded. Again, we can, we're, uh, hoping to provide more of a summary a little bit later this week, but it is a lot of information that we've tried to comb our, our way through to that instance. Lastly, I would just mention that given this evolving role, the role of recovery will be changing as we will move more into that compliance, that coordination, but we won't be administering dollars the way that we were in that, that prior 
uh, round in 2020. So we will continue to support and coordinate um, and be able to track, maintain, and monitor in terms of compliance across these dollars. Lastly, and I won't walk through all of these, there are just a few slides back there that do show the dashboard where you can go in and see various investments and on the website, you can do this data as a whole and see by the various spark categories, the level of dollar investment. You can also do individual counties or groups of counties. And if anyone, um, any of you or your staff need help navigating that dashboard, let us know. But we just wanna make sure you know that it's a, there and helps you see um, that data. The current dashboard is through the November 30 data. We will have the December 30 data updated by the first of next week. It just takes us a little bit of time to get everything up and going, as you can imagine. Lastly, as I wrap this up, I would just want to say that please know that the, the stories, the impact that we are hearing across the state in terms of how these dollars have been used has been tremendous. Um, the impact on individual businesses, on families, on communities, on our infrastructure continues to grow. Um, and we continue to work to help to make sure these dollars are invested directly where they're impacting Kansas. I know that was fast. I will um, stop sharing my screen and um, we'll uh, stand for questions. I will answer as much as I can, um, but we'll ask the committees uh, grace in that um, if we have to get information back to you, um, we will do so as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, one question I had is, uh, do you have any anticipated time frame on receiving the $1.5 billion? The, oh, for the new dollars? Yes. So that's the interesting start. It's coming in in different tranches, right? And so because some of that 1.5, that and that's a that is a big estimate. Um, for instance, um, SNAP funds were um, that um, were increased at, you know, so it's an existing federal program for, you know, family um, food benefits that was already increased. And so that department already has access to. Oh, did you lose me? Think they lost me. Did you lose me? You're back now. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. No, nope. you, we didn't catch any of that. So okay, no problem. So um, I can see your screen go out, which is why I knew you might have lost me. <laughs> um, so they're coming in in different waves and in different tranches. So there is not going to be one complete allocation. So for instance, um, for dollars associated with, are you all hearing me? Oh, uh, you're you're breaking up right now. Yep, I can see that. I can see your screen. Okay, you're back now. Okay, I'll try to do this quick. They're coming in in different tranches at different times through different agencies. We will try to provide you a list of our best guess estimate when each bucket of money either comes to the state or we think it may be available, but it will not come in a lump sum like the last bucket. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Senator Fagg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was wondering on page 36, uh, it talks about education, and I know the community college says 9.4 million, public universities 55.5. You know how they decide that formula? On so that kind of thing? I can provide some uh, d additional detail information. Our dashboard is a combination of dollars that may have gone through entities like KBOR or other entities, as well as dollars that may have gone through counties. And so you can actually see education dollars in multiple places on that, that interactive dashboard. Some of it will be under county allocations under, under, say for instance, higher ed. And then some of it would be under the actual education tab. So it's a it's a, a little understand there were multiple flows of dollars moving through. One of the things that we're working on now, which we actually think just based on some of the questions might be helpful, is a full breakdown of both the K-12 and higher ed investment that happen, both from various state entities as well as from county entities, so that you can see it in a much clearer picture. Because that snapshot, I think, does not provide you enough information to understand where those dollars came from or where they went. Senator Hawk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you for an excellent report. 
Uh, one question we've asked, and I'm not sure you can answer it um, yet, but uh, we have uh, three to six months, I think, of auditing that will be done, and as you said, compliance. If, if we find out that some of these dollars uh, was not spent appropriate by, appropriately by the criteria, uh, what will happen to that? Will uh, those agencies or counties need to pay that back? Will the state be liable? Or do we really know yet till we get more guidance from the feds? So what I would say is that um, when we find, and this, hap this has actually happened throughout and we work directly with agencies and counties, occasionally we will find expenses that are not eligible. Am I froze? Do you hear me now? We can hear you now, yes. We, we caught most of that. Okay. Um, so what happens, uh, Senator Hawk, is that we will work with them to see if they have other eligible expenses that would, would could go in their place. With most entities, they actually have more eligible expenses than dollars they receive. And a lot of times it's about just the eligibility um, Looks like I'm froze. Let's see. Can you we hear can me? still hear you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we can still hear you. Um, so a lot of times it's just, just about the eligibility of an individual expense. Um, if for some reason we find something that is a major issue, we do have the ability at the state level to recoup those dollars or to say that those dollars must be paid back. It is the state's responsibility to then spend those dollars accordingly, um, matched on to um, eligibility and criteria. So technically, if we had to, they could, those dollars could be pulled back or paid back and then used elsewhere. I will tell you, though, in most instances, because entities have um, additional eligible expenses, that we work with them to make sure that the expenses are eligible and or find other eligible expenses to be able to utilize those dollars for that entity, whether that's a state entity or a county or um, an entity that received a grant. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, yes, and I like that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Petty. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of a follow-up. So is that when uh, the question about the if whether any group had used all of their funds, would that be when that March 1st date would come into place that you would then look at uh, reallocating funds? It will for most. We'll have a couple of entities. Um, so like uh, there's a, uh, a, a program that was started under round three, which is remote learning. We know that remote learning is going to go well past uh, March 1st because they'll have expenses that will go through the end of the semester. Right. Um, with broadband, we have a number of broadband co projects. They um, are near completion, but they may or may not mark, meet March 1. What we anticipate based on the numbers that we have right now is probably close to 80 to 85 percent of the entities will be done by March 1st. It's kind of why we picked that as a target. And that last group, we will work with them to make sure that they have plans in place to complete and spend their funds accordingly and anticipate that most, if not all, should be done by the end of our fiscal year. Remembering now, we technically have until the end of December to spend these funds, but we're trying to be prudent and make sure that we're using the dollars accordingly and, and because the needs are currently here. And that's why we're working with the entities. But most will be done by that March 1, but it gives us a good marker um, to be able to then work with any of the entities that are not to ensure that they have a plan in place for the spending of those dollars. Mr. Chairman, I have another question, if that's all right. Yeah. Senator Petty. And, and I'm... I'm I'm happy for all of us that that uh, date was extended past um, December of uh, 2020. Uh, and the new funds that, uh, the 2021 funds that are coming in, and it appears from what you provided for us that the, and what you've said is that those funds are, are going specifically out to specific entities. Does that mean that there's less oversight for the state or does the state still have uh, uh, an abundance of oversight for those funds? We still have a certain level of oversight, um, particularly for the funds that come in through our state agencies. Um, we have our regular uh, processes um, in terms of my, actually in the Department of Administration, our Office of Accounts and Reports. That's where we report all of our federal funding that comes in 
regularly. That's how we do audits, both, both single audits as well as the state's comprehensive audit. So for a lot of the new dollars, we'll fall more into the, the tracking, the compliance, our standard state processes for a lot of that, because those dollars will flow through a lot of the existing federal programs that are already there. Dollars are coming in at a higher level or they um, entities have the ability to draw down more federal dollars. So I don't know that it's less um, compliance. It's, it'll just shift a little bit different. The, the 2020 dollars were so open that we had to create a process through Spark and so forth to say where they were going to go and then monitor them accordingly. These dollars, many of them will come into pre-existing funds that are already there, you know, federal accounts that are already there that we draw down from. So we will continue to monitor them. We'll have oversight, but it will look much more like our standard auditing and oversight and compliance processes. Um, and those flow through the Office of Accounts and Reports. Did you get that? We, we got most of it. We just missed okay. right at the end, but I, I think we, we all understand what you was trying to say. <laughs> Any other? Whether, I, whether you've seen from the funding that we got in 20 and now into 21, are, are there any specific pieces of legislation that uh, have come up that you feel are necessary that we be that we should be looking at this session in, in order to make the best use of the dollars? I apologize. I did not hear you all cut out at the very beginning of your question. And so the first thing I heard was 21. So I'm just uh, interested in whether with the funding that we got in 20 and now into 21, are you seeing any specific pieces of legislation that we need to be looking at to make the best use of these dollars? I would say my first response would probably be um, no, but I don't know that um, I'd, I'd let, I'd, ask for a little bit of grace to, to say, maybe we can get back to you on that and kind of look at them. Particularly, I'm breaking up, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, particularly on the yes. new dollar, okay. With the new dollars and particularly the new relief, we don't know enough yet. And there may be some spaces in there. Um, and as we learn more, we can continue to share. I would say with the 2020 dollars, with so much of it, you know, with all of it being already allocated, and um, you know, over uh, 90 million of it already been expended. There's not as much opportunity there. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator Fay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was wondering uh, what kind of timeline do you think these formulas will be coming out uh, to know into what areas? Yeah. Has there been any conversation about that? What I will say is, and hopefully um, the, the work that we're trying to do um, this week will give you a little bit of insight. They're all coming out at different levels. So you're talking about the new relief bill, correct, sir? Yes. Yeah, they're coming out at different times because they're coming directly from the federal agencies. So for instance, we've already received or they have already published the formulas around um, a few of the programs related to uh, children and families. Um, they've already published the formula and calculated the dollar amount around eviction and utility assistance. Um, but we haven't received the formula for um, agri the agriculture related grants. So because each federal entity is going to be responsible for those formulas, they're coming out piecemeal. And what we're going to try to do from the recovery office is try to be a source of information as we start to learn, we're going to try to push that information out, you know, to entities like yourselves to say, here's the ones that have come in this week in terms of the guidance that's available. You know, here are the ones that are still pending. Here are the ones that have been automatically um, distributed to the state. Um, and so, but that's a piece that we're still learning. It is truly all over the place. They are all at different levels and different markers. We're tracking on it, but right now it is, um, I think you lost me. Did you lose me? We still we we can still hear you. 
Perfect. Um, so right now, um, what we're trying to do is get our, our hands around it so that we can give ongoing updates um, so that people know what dollars to expect and to win. And if it's based on a formula, once we get that guidance, we're sharing that out. Thank you. Any other questions, Senator Hawk? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is on unemployment and Department of Labor. And I know uh, that the Sport Committee wanted to allocate, and I think did in round three, $30 million to Department of Labor. And then I noticed in the governor's budget, we're trying to get back into the modernization mm -hmm. of uh, the servers there and the software hardware combination. Um, did any of that $30 million help with that modernization? And do you think we're gonna be in a better position over the next year to better manage some of the frustrations that I'm sure um, a lot of our citizens have had being able to get their unemployment benefits? But I also wanna commend Department of Labor trying to, to manage what has been an unmanageable task. So uh, where, where are we with uh, Spark money or CARES money? And, and this modernization. Right. KDA. So um, I will speak a, a little bit to that and it's a, a combination of a few of my hats, including the fact that I am the Chief Information Technology Officer as well. And so have been um, integral uh, with their IT operations during this time, but also would you know encourage you all to reach directly out to labor because they can paint a, a bigger picture that goes beyond just the IT component. What I will say is that the 30 million that was given to labor, are you guys hearing me okay? Good, no. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Is that better? We got you. Okay. The 30 million that was given to layer, labor under um, the 2020 CRF dollars was for stabilization. And so it was used not only for IT, but it was also used for a lot of their surge support. And so that was the ramping up of the call centers, um, being able to dwindle down their backlog, which they've been able to do. Um, and so that 30 million wasn't designed to be directly for modernization. But what I can tell you just from understanding kind of that IT lens is that every dollar that helps us support their stabilization has allowed them to further their process, their parallel process around modernization. So they are working on their feasibility study for their modernization project. And they actually have a separate team that is dedicated and has been working throughout this entire time on modernization because they've been able to dedicate additional resources around the stabilization. And so um, do I think we'll be in a better place? I know that we're better than we were six months ago and three months from now, I believe we'll be better. And I think we'll continue to get stronger. But at the same time, we have to keep that parallel movement going because that modernization and being able to get there is the true end goal. But in the in-between, we want to make sure that we are paying out, that we are meeting citizens' needs and that it's not just about the long-term, but that we're addressing the immediate. And so so those two buckets of money, the, the CRF that was invested versus what the governor is asking for in our budget are slightly different, but they work in conjunction and in parallel to each other. I hope that answered your question, Cindy. Yes, very much. Thank you, uh, Secretary Burns-Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any other questions? Senator Petty. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, this did raise another question for me. So we just before uh, you came on, we had a presentation or we had it listen to a bill that deals with the state fair. Uh, and I noticed on here under commerce that it's grants for live venues. And yet um, the chair of the fair, uh, Senator Berger, uh, felt that there was not going to be any money coming that way in this new funding. Uh, do you know any more about that? We don't, but we have calls in. We thought as well when we first saw the original um, pieces of the legislation that, that state fairs might qualify under those live venues. 
Um, some of the additional information that we've gotten is a little bit conflicting. And so it's one of the things that we're exploring. But as of right now, we have we don't have a clear indication that state fairs would be able to qualify under that live venue. But as soon as we know or if we find out anything different or if and, and here's the key to all of this, um, what was what was accurate the first week of January, a week after this bill came out and what is accurate now? can be different because of the change in administration. Some of the guidance is changing over time. So we are keeping our ears to the ground. Um, the State Fair has been a, a great partner that we've been watching and trying to assist and help throughout this process, and they are very much on our radar. So if we do find anything, they, we will let them know immediately. But as of right now, he is correct. We haven't seen anything yet um, based on the information, but that was one of the indicators we thought as well early on. So. Um, to be continued. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, Secretary uh, Burns-Wallace, thank you a lot for your information this morning. Appreciate your joining us. Thank Have you, and, and uh, thank you for working through the technical difficulties. I appreciate it. Next item we have is, uh, I want to go back to uh, bill introductions, and I'd like to introduce a bill. Uh, bill is, uh, number is 21KS0679, and it has to do with dealing with the IDD community rates. I'll make a motion to, and seconded by Senator Hawk. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. With that, uh, uh, our agenda is completed for the day, so we are adjourned.